Okay, and here we are. Um, I think we should be live right now. I'm not 100% sure, but I think we are. <laughs> We're live and Ginger's live. Ginger's live as well. Great, yes. Apparently, we, we are live even though I can't get to... Okay, here we are. Officially 100% live. How are you, Susan? I'm doing great. How are you, Christina? Great. I'm so excited to have you, to Yay. Have you today and Yay. to be able to, <laughs> to talk with you. Um, you're always someone that I um, go back to if I need something and if I want to discuss something about language learning. And so I'm so happy to uh, have you here today so you can share some of your experience with us. Well, it's the same for me, and I was missing you this week because usually we have a nice chat every week. And so here we're going to have it with, um, to have with it. some of our followers here on Facebook. Exactly. So, there you go. And if anyone feels like they want to join the conversation, um, I, we are here. We are checking all of our comments. And so mm. feel free to ask us anything, and we will be happy to take your question and to uh, interact a little bit more. So, Susan, how are you doing in these strange time well uh i'm doing fine but yes it's a bit of a, a holding pattern we would say in english you know it's like you're kind of uh, it's like when uh, an airplane is finally arriving at the destination but there's no uh, they can't land and so they circle around over a city sometimes that's how it feels but isn't um, that so frustrating? Like after yes. a long flight, you know, and you know, you're you feel like the anticipation. You're just you're <laughs> already feeling it. Like now I'm getting out, and I'm yes, gonna, and then and then they're like, nope, we're not landing yet. No, nope. and you need a shower, and you need you know you just can't wait to stretch. And so that's a bit of the moment we're living. I think so many of us. Uh, I do have to say though that um, you know. Thankfully, there's always lots of, um, we can always travel with our minds. And I find that this has been um, such a creative moment for so many of us and uh, where we would explore things that normally we would be so focused on doing and a little less on being and uh, letting some of those ideas kind of come to the surface. So I'll take, I'll take the good with the bad. We have to take the good, and I agree with mm. you definitely. Um, also, with our our work with Europass this time, even though we miss our teachers so much, mm. and we can't wait to have them all back in form. <laughs> it's true, um, but it it definitely gave us the time to work on some projects mm -hmm. that probably we wouldn't have had the mental energy or the mental space to take on if, that's exactly right you know, so we have to um, enjoy the positive side but still i i, I like your your metaphor of <laughs> hovering with the airplane yes exactly yes because like we can see like our destination is right you there. can see it like we are there <laughs> <laughs> Lots of out of the plane. <laughs> and then you know and they've taken our earphones away and they we are in the upright position we're we're and ready. we're ready but uh, oh well that's all right and so christina i'm so glad that you asked me to come today to talk about a topic that i really like i know mm, yeah I, it was, was a good a very interesting idea i've been thinking a lot about it about the role of emotion. about the topic mm -hmm. okay yes so, of course, I, I contacted uh, you to talk about this specific topic because you have a, a long experience as a language teacher, but mm -hmm. you are also a counselor. So you definitely have a different perspective on the role of emotions, not only in learning, but you definitely also have a vision on that too. And so I wanted to hear from you. Um, a little bit what you what you think and what what your perspective is well emotions are at the heart of the process and um, I think that a lot of my personal um, style as in, in education uh, has been inspired by my own experiences as a child and oh yes, um, because um, I think that I I realize 
where I was more motivated and where I was ultimately, um, well, I, I don't want to say necessarily more successful because I got wonderful grades, but where I felt more self-efficacy mm-hmm. was because um, there was a, a relationship with the educator. The, or there was a, somehow a relationship that wasn't necessarily a friendship, that was still a teacher, but that um, my uh, emotions were stimulated in a way that helped my memory. It mm-hmm. helped my level of engagement. There was uh, uh, also this feeling of, um, well, that I, was, I felt a greater connection to what I was doing. It made more sense. And um, as I have then grown professionally and continued with my studies and was able to actually work with uh, so many young children um, and, and adults as well. And I see how time and time again, the role of emotions and as, uh, in, for example, as language teachers, using that even just in, in thinking about our educational design makes an enormous difference in how much our students are motivated and actually how much they are able to learn and grow. Um, I don't know if you've experienced that in your lifetime as well. Definitely. It's, I, well, the, the, one of the suggestions that I find myself um, giving over and over is to find a way to make the language learning um, fun and interesting for you and engaging for you, um, mm-hmm. which rarely uh, coincides with grammar exercises. And more often it tends to have to do with involving yourself in the language mm-hmm. and in, in emerging yourself in the language through a topic that's engaging for you to a topic that is interesting to you. And in that way, you are able to see the language as a, as a mean, let's say, and not as a destination. And you're able to enjoy the trip and you might actually get somewhere in the process. But if, you know, we have, there's, I, I always say, there's so, so much willpower that we have during our days. And if after a hard day of work, after the chores that you have to do at home, and after all that, you are able to sit down and say, okay, now I have to do my English exercises. (laughs) Yes. Yes, there's just so long that you can do that. And we know in language learning that, you know, long-term commitment and Mm long-term consistency Mm -hmm. is often the key. So you need to find a way to make that work for you. Well, you're touching upon something that's fundamental in language teaching. And I would say in every uh, every kind of teaching. So, for example, the teachers that might um, come to might attend your, the language courses uh, at Europass or any any language courses that they might attend um, can also reflect upon what then they're uh, teaching during the day in their native language. But this idea that we are a source of energy. We're a source of energy and we are um, a vehicle towards opening up windows onto knowledge, onto self-awareness, um, onto uh, relationships with uh, your know, classmates. And so we, mm, w- let's say that considering what our emotions are as the teacher, how to take care of ourselves, how to make sure that we um, are also filling up getting nourishment that's going to uh, and and this nourishment can be in just you know getting enough rest in making sure that we uh, do some mindfulness but also like you were talking about finding what makes us come alive us coming alive this is already going to be a very attractive energy for our students on top of that when we talk about like second language acquisition Um, there's something very special about it because when we're all in there learning maths or which is another anxiety producing subject, 
but um, let's say maths or science or other subjects, but we're doing them in our native language, we have um, a certain amount of frustration or maybe curiosity, uh, perhaps mm, some confusion that leads to um, let's say discovery or confusion that leads to frustration, it can go in different directions. Yeah. When we're talking about second language acquisition, we are talking about a place where we become very vulnerable. We become vulnerable because we are stripped of a very important part of our sense of security, our words. The vocabulary that we use, the sounds that we produce with our mouths even, um, the way that we put one word in front of another, you know, after another, and we form things. Um, and of course, as we know, in, uh, you know, first language acquisition from childhood, it's just an automatic process. You are uh, absorbing unconsciously uh, a whole series of grammatical structures and then later when you have the cognitive ability you actually study why so what what's happening here is you are stripped of all of that and you um have to uh rethink everything so you've lost kind of like the ground under your feet and if students don't have a strong mm, uh, let's say a, a, a relationship and a feeling that they can feel safe to make these mistakes and explore, maybe even have some fun with it, um, maybe have a good sense of humor about it. It's very difficult for the teacher to just come in and work on a cognitive level. When you talked about grammar, and it's funny because I actually um, have often really enjoyed teaching grammar, especially to younger children, because I uh, found a way to use their bodies. And uh, because when once your body is engaged, then something else happens. And I can remember many times, and if I have any former students who are following us here, um, I can remember when we were learning uh, how, you know, how to form a basic sentence structure in English, and when we were talking about the verb to be, and, um, and, and the verbs that, uh, ha, you know, that use not after them, right? So I am not Italian. And so I would just sort of assign different ones. Okay, you, you're the subject, come on over. And then you, you're my verb, come. And then you are not, poor little not, come here, not, oh, you know. And uh, so the not would have to come and kind of, and then, um, you know, whatever, uh, whatever adjective we were going to use. And I would actually physically put them in the right position. And sometimes they would be holding a little sign, sometimes not. And then I would tell them um, how they were best friends and so they could be connected, you know. So, um, you know, I'm, things like that. But what happened was not so much that I got so much grammar teaching done, perhaps I could have, uh, it would have seemed like I was doing more if I had just said, this is the exercise and then do, you know, 25 of them. And but I know that um, there's always going to be a certain number of my students in the class that are not going to respond to that type of learning. We also need that. But if they can connect it to an experience, even if it's an artificial experience, that it's very often what happens in second language learning, yeah. but that uh, it, you connect it to an experience that created an emotion, and then the memory is much more stimulated. You have a greater chance of, well, connecting with it. You felt it in your body. You were laughing. You remember when then, you know, your friend not, you know, was you, you, there's a, a whole series of things. But it also means that the teacher needs to be a little vulnerable. That the teacher, I mean, obviously, we might feel much uh, safer and, and more secure if we're standing in front of the classroom and showing an example. And then, you know, having them do these exercises and we grade them that we are but we are only working with their cognitive brain at that moment yes i think it's it takes a, a lot of effort for us to also move as teachers from our mm -hmm. comfortable space because it, it does feel um easier we feel more in control of what is happening we feel mm -hmm. that we can you know scale and test and grade what is happening and that we can manage that very well 
Yes. And at the same time, um, what you are saying, the type of exercises that you are talking about, mm -hmm. um, engage so many different aspects and so many different um, also mm, cognitive styles and different um, experiences. And some will remember uh, because they were engaged in first person. Some mm -hmm. will remember their, their friend was engaged. And so mm -hmm. they were watching and they were laughing. Um, but definitely is, um, have you ever heard about the Baker Baker experiment? No, tell me about it. So they, they tested um, a group of people and to one group of people, they told to remember a name, uh -huh. and the name was John Baker. Uh -huh. Not to remember, they mentioned, my friend John Baker did this. Uh -huh. And to another group, they said, I have a friend, and he is a baker. So it's the same word, but it was much easier for people to remember that your friend was a baker <laughs> than that your friend's name was Baker. Because the name Baker, it's nothing to them. It's a, it's a series of letter is completely disconnected from their reality and from their experience. Mm. So you are throwing there something. Oh, this is my friend. His name is John Baker. Okay. And on the other hand, you are saying, this is my friend. He is a baker. Mm -hmm. and, and right, just as you say it, in your mind, you see bread, you see flour, you mm -hmm. see, you know, mm -hmm. you, you remember when you tried to bake something and it didn't end up so well. You remember your baker from your childhood and your, your neighborhood where you grew up. So a baker to you means something, is connected to your experience and to your um, life. Yes. And, and so it, it sticks. And this is such an enormous part of, uh, of language learning. It, as we said, we're, we are, as teachers, we're also asked to um, create situations to evoke, to evoke um, uh, fantasies you know, or emotions. Um, have your students imagine, because in this artificial situation of language learning, where you're, you're in the same classroom, OK, um, and you're actually not always out on the street meeting people um, and being able to use that little bit of uh, English that you've learned. And so it needs I think that um, foreign language teachers are kind of a special animal. They mm, they have powers if they can kind of find them um, that really go beyond something that, um, let's say, in, in, in sort of creating fantasy worlds and imagining new things. And there was also another thing that I was thinking about when it comes to, um, well, when it, we're actually talking about foreign languages in general, um, there have been many studies done. Um, for example, Elaine Horowitz talked about an actual specific emotion that's called foreign language anxiety. OK, so, yes, I mean, we all have experience anxiety, but I think that we all know about that special anxiety that's connected to foreign language. Then, you know, there's probably public speaking anxiety that's not that different. But a foreign language anxiety um, is something that uh, can become a, a tremendous obstacle to actually then using that little bit of language that, you know, Absolutely. and um, yesterday on my Facebook page, kind of in preparation for uh, our talk today, um, and then on another Facebook group that I'm on, I actually asked some questions of the people um, because I, I wanted to I wanted them to reflect upon, and I'm going to read a couple so questions. You wanted first-hand testimony. I want, yes, and I ask questions, and I'm going to ask even the people who are listening to us right now, to think about their own experience, whether you are a, 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 actually a foreign language teacher or you are someone that's interested in improving your English or whatever, just even anyone that's involved in education, think about what kinds of emotions have you felt when confronted with a foreign language? When you, even you, Christina, when you go to a new place and you're confronted with a foreign language, 
Um, especially you are already bilingual, let's say trilingual. But um, if you were monolingual and, you, and, or, and you're going to a place where you are confronted with a language that you don't know, what kinds of emotions would you feel? So I definitely, uh, I learned um, another language in my adult life. Mm -hmm. So I can uh, relate, even though I was already bilingual, but I, I started learning a third language in my uh, 20s. Uh -huh. and, um, so definitely frustration. Uh -huh. um, when you are a little bit more um, in an intermediate level, yes. it can be kind of frustrating. Because also mm -hmm. everyone knows me, I'm, I'm a bit of a talker. So... <laughs> For me, not being able to express what I wanted to say, mm -hmm. thinking about something and being like, oh, this would be so fun if I could get to say it in my language. That's right. And and, and knowing that no one could understand what, and, and so like feeling this, like there was an invisible wall yes. between me and the other people that I wanted to communicate with. And it's not only a wall in communication, but it's an it's in your identity. It's in helping the other person understand who you are. And often what we need to rely on in these situations are a, a series of nonverbal cues that we um, maybe don't think about, or even just a, a way, an attitude, a demeanor. Um, maybe uh, as you're learning a foreign language, because your language abilities are not very high, you feel like you need to be especially agreeable, very sweet. Um, you feel a little guilty maybe that people are having to kind of struggle with speaking to you um, and that you're a little bit of a burden on them. And uh, this can really, and it, and so much depends on how the other person receives your, uh, let's say your level um, and your abilities. Um, and I, oftentimes our first, the second question too was, um, you know, how much did those emotions affect your ability to understand or to speak? Because a little frustration and a little anxiety and a little stress we know can really actually stimulate us, right? But it has to be a small enough obstacle. If instead we are in, um, in, a, in an experience, we're having an experience where we are, every two words are corrected. Where, um, and not only corrected verbally, but maybe there's even like a nonverbal. Um, where you're getting this kind of feedback, you start becoming very self-conscious. And already you have been stripped of your sense of a bit of your identity and a sense of security. So when what we know about learning is that when the obstacle becomes too high, we might just decide to sit and not even face the obstacle. Or we might, maybe in our younger days, we might have cried. Or we may have started to be misbehave as a way to get away from those feelings of inadequacy and not feeling very safe. Um, and that's something that um, even as adults, especially adult learners, a lot of the people that, um, I, that, that were so kind to answer some of my questions talked about this um, frustration, fear, um, and um, let's say that the fear and this anxiety being an obstacle to actually producing what you could produce. Definitely. I mean, foreign language learners often will find, they often say, well, I understand a lot more than I can say. Now we know for uh, cognitive reasons, there are very good reasons for that. Because it's one thing to, let, let's say, receive information. Definitely. It's another thing to receive, uh, process that information and then produce it. Yes. So we and know that, this, and that's, you know. Fear, this fear produces also a negative cycle because what happens is that when you do produce and you have a positive feedback, that gives you that it's, it's a really good propellant. It's a very good fuel for moving forward and for trying a little harder and for taking that little extra step out of your comfort zone because you're seeing that this, this is working well. And so if you, if you shut down, you lose those opportunities to 
you use the right word because that uh, when the fear or the anxiety um, or the shame, this is a big one, shame in language learning, because, you know, first of all, teenagers, that's like the worst emotion that you could evoke in them. If you ever want them to be motivated in your classroom is for them to feel sh ashamed, humiliated. Um, and it doesn't take much to humiliate a teenager. They have a very acute sense of shame. And um, oh, of course, they're in a moment where they're very interested in what their peers think of them. Yeah. And so it's like a social death, you know. So, so many times what looks like bad behavior is actually a compensation. Uh, I don't do well in this class. Instead of feeling that humiliation or that shame, I'm going to um, make my peers accept me because I'm going, I'll create a diversion. I'll make it, you know, I'll make a joke. I'll make it a power struggle between me and the teacher. And to, uh, a really, um, an educator that's in tune with this will recognize that mm, something interesting is happening here. And so how can I create a more positive emotional atmosphere which does not mean that you are their mother or their friend and you tell them you, you know, you, you baby them. No, but you might say, hmm, this very student who is misbehaving, um, perhaps because there is a little bit of a sense of inadequacy or maybe how could I use that energy in a positive way? How can I use, you know, if they're, they're funny and they disrupt my class because they're making jokes. Well, let's use it and say, you know, Bobby, you are always so funny. And I was wondering, how would you feel we were going to do this skit about, um, you know, the sketch where uh, there's a patient that goes to the doctor's office and, you know, you could you be like the patient that's a hypochondriac and, you know, you give them a role. And it's also very important for the, the teacher at that moment to realize it, that's not the moment to be critiquing every aspect of his language, uh, second language production. Sure. But this is, it's not easy for teachers because there's this feeling like, you know, you're not doing your job, you know, if you're, um, you're not constantly correcting things and making them just right. And instead, um, part of like the emotional connection that we need to foster is to also realize that there's a moment, there's a time and a place for each of these things that sometimes Students need to feel safe enough to just go with it. Be uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, Christina, what many people wrote to me was that their language skills got significantly better after a couple of glasses of wine. Of course. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was shocked. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> of and of course. course and, and, and so, I mean, if we think about that, it makes perfect sense. It does. And you, also there's a little um, a little thing that I always um, try to remember and is our survival instinct, mm -hmm. which is, um, and sometimes in our, as you said, artificial language experiences that we try to create, they are not enough to stimulate that um, survival instinct. And so I've seen, I've witnesses, uh, I've witnessed with my eyes um. in many years of lessons with adults, because I've worked mostly with adults. Um. I can tell you, I, I can vividly remember two or three episodes of people that in the classroom, I would have to struggle so much to get a word out of them. It was really, and they were like, um, I would ask them a question in English and they would be like, oh, um, no, no, um, well, te, lo, te lo dico in italiano. And, <laughs> and they were, they just, it, it just feel like they couldn't. And then one day during class, they got an important work call that they couldn't not answer. And they answered and started talking in English. Oh, and everyone was like, oh, what's going on? But they just felt in a classroom with a teacher who they knew could speak Italian and with all their peers in the class, their classmates that could speak mm -hmm. Italian, they just felt that they they were not like enough uh, well, 
created for that production. But if they had to, their skills were significantly different than the one that we were allowed to see in our mm -hmm. artificial environment. So, and I mean, think about the fact that so much of what educators do is assess, evaluate, judge. Judgment, when I feel judged, I am inhibited. So, of course, language teachers are in the business of also assessing. I don't like that part of the job, frankly. That's my least favorite part, but it's part of the job. I think it's important for teachers uh, to realize that um, just as there are going to be moments where we're not going to be correcting all the time, we're going to let the language flow. There's also times where we need to let, uh, let's say where we're not always um, uh, putting a, a grade for everything, um, always having to, oh, you know, that you did that very well, plus or mm, minus. Mm, we, because in real life, it doesn't really happen like that. Yeah. In real life, I mean, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a perfect example. And um, I, have, I have a dear friend who, if she listens to this, she could tell a lot of really bad stories about me. I was a terrible language student. Terrible. I didn't connect with it. I was, I think I first started taking French when I was maybe in middle school, which of course in middle school, you don't even know what your name is. It's just, you know, and so I remember being, having a very hard time. Um, I had a little bit of problems with attention and focus. So then what would happen is you get a little bit behind and then you would be called on and you would feel that, like I call it the burst of negative emotion that, um, you know, that fear, you know that, you know that feeling, I mean, Christina, when you feel that tingling of, okay, and that emotion rises up into my head and fogs my cognitive abilities to even understand the question that's being asked of me. I'm not even thinking about what the answer could be. I don't even know what she's talking about. And I had this experience over and over again. It was a teacher who I'm sure was doing the best she could, but for some reason, there was no connection between us. There was no relationship. Now, I'm not saying that the teacher would have needed to do anything very special for me, but it would have been helpful seeing that I probably had a little trouble with focus and a little bit of attention. It would have been helpful for the teacher to help ground me, keep me grounded, just by maybe coming by my desk and just a little smile and saying, How's it going? Do you need anything? It would have made all the difference because uh, I felt like I was swimming in an ocean of um, uncertainty and uh, vulnerability and also confusion and having knowing that there was what we call a buoy. You know, a buoy is uh, the thing that floats in the ocean. It doesn't move, okay. right? Okay. Um, it would have been kind of a buoy for me. Um, and just knowing that I was seen and kind of accepted for just who I was and, you know, not necessarily connected to my ability in her class, um, it would have made a big difference because I followed the script of many students where if you start not accumulating um, a lack of success, then you in order to not commit a kind of like social suicide with your peers, you start acting like, I don't care. And you use indifference to, this, protect. to protect yourself. When a student is acting indifferent, the emotion, that is what we see. That's the behavior. And as we know, all behavior is communication. And so if we look, Behind. If we're curious, if we're curious, we say, gee, he sure is acting or she is acting indifferent. Maybe we might realize that behind indifference, there's a difficulty. And usually it's a vulnerability. It's a fear. And so if we could it, connect with that student, like I said, not doing anything special. You don't need to be, you know, their psychologist or their mother, but just, you know, that little bit of contact um, that, uh, and even uh, noticing something perhaps that is working. 
I loved when the teacher would put on those old, oh my gosh, we had these, I don't even know if they were cassette tapes. Okay. Here I'm, I'm, I'm showing my age, but, and the teacher, the teacher would put on these um, recordings. And to this day, I don't know a thing about French. And I can tell you, bonjour, mon ami, comment va tu? Très bien, merci, comment va tu? That stayed in my head because I enjoyed that. Yeah. And I could imitate those sounds. And it made me feel kind of important. Yeah. Unfortunately, we did that maybe once a month. But oh. I just remember that that was something that was very important for me. And so um, feeling that I was capable of this gave me, a, a, well, it didn't give me enough motivation, I, I hate to say. But yes. let's say that um, I still, I remember those moments fondly. Now, the important thing to realize is that um, we do tend to uh, engage more in, in, in new material and what we're learning when we are in a bit more of a, let's say, in a, in a concentrated but relaxed state. So not relaxed, not bored, but a feeling of um, kind of that we're safe and that we are, um, that something's happening that's um, hmm, interesting for us, that we, um, let's say that our amygdala, okay, which is the part of our brain where we process emotion, um, is not necessarily mm, dealing with a bombardment of, let's say, uh, the kinds of emotions that cut off our cognitive ability, uh, then we, um, we might not necessarily be having fun all the time, or we might, it might not necessarily be a feeling of joy, but it might just be sort of a, a, a quiet hum of concentration. These, all of these kinds of emotions are very good for learning something. Okay, and I, I hope that teachers realize that we talk a lot about positive education in, in our courses. And um, there could be a bit of confusion over is positive education, meaning that we have to be happy all the time and that I have to be an entertainer and not a teacher? No, no. Uh, but it's about designing experiences in your classroom that are going to foster um, let's say um, more positive emotions or even the so-called negative emotions like frustration. Can we, uh, is it too big a frustration? So or do we need, we need, is it manageable or is it just enough that you're like, ah, oh, you know, maybe I want to get it right. right. I want to get it right. Like, ah, oh, especially when we play games, um, you know, games and language learning can be such a great way what happens is they stop think they stop being self conscious. Yeah, when they're having a good time, or when they're you know they want to win that point. And um, so I would say that there's no way that you could disconnect emotion from learning in general, but from language learning in particular, because of the fact that you are stripped of so many. Um, the foundation yep. of yep. your communication. Yep. Definitely. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I could go on and on about it. Susan, it was great as usual talking to you. <laughs> but you gave us so, much, so many interesting, just like hints and, and things to like seeds that um, I'm sure I'm going to keep thinking about for the next days. And I'm sure it's going to be the same for the many teachers that followed us today. Oh. So we had... Um, and we're happy to continue the conversation in the chat. If anybody watches, you know, and yeah, sometimes uh, two days, it, yes, yeah, yeah, sometimes that you know, when when we're having a conversation like this, and you're like, you know, there's 500 other examples or things, um, and you know, people who are listening are, uh, you know, saying, well, but I have a different issue. Um, but one thing I do want to say, in kind of, um, they, in recognizing the experiences that many of these people shared with me, one of the biggest um, uh, positive emotions that they that people feel in foreign language learning is pride and satisfaction for when you do overcome those obstacles because as you know in language learning it's like you feel like you maybe well, I'm not getting anywhere and then suddenly something happens and like you expressed it better or you had a dream in that language and you were speaking much better in the dream than you do in real life which is a whole other thing yeah. and um, these feelings of pride this is the basis for self-esteem 
And self-esteem, as you know, it's self-perpetuating motivation. Yeah. Yeah. We have to find a way to get a positive cycle going and not a bad cycle where I feel judged, I'm afraid, so I don't, you know, I don't expose myself and so I don't practice. And Mm -hmm. that we need to get a positive cycle going on where I try something, it works well. So next time I'm going to try a little more. That's right. That's right. Um, and there are certain uh, languages and cultures that are easier for that. A lot of people find when they come to Italy that la- living Italian is facilitated by the fact that Italians are particularly understanding. Yeah, they are. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, Christina, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being with us. It was great talking to you as usual. Yeah, it's always um, good to see you and talk I to you. Think, I think we haven't talk this through and I think we will need to do another live but yes. so, um, in the next people who are watching right now and people who will be watching in the following days um, feel free to pop any questions in the comment and we will be monitoring the comment section of this video for the next few days so uh, absolutely we'll be, happy, we'll be happy to answer any question and continue our conversation so this but, was like emotions and language learning part one part one we'll yes really so means, have a can, part two. that would be great Thank you so much. I feel like we need a part two. Yes. (laughs) We always do. We always do. (laughs) Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your day. And so everyone that's listening to us. Yes. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.